Well, good morning again. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to invite you to open up to Romans chapter 8. We're finishing our time in Romans 8 this morning. So in 2013, Matthew McConaughey put out a movie called Mud. It's kind of one of his lesser known movies. I don't know if it got a whole lot of airtime or if people really know of it. And it's a story of, of two young boys. It's set on the Mississippi River down in Arkansas. And it's a story of two young boys who one day are out on the Mississippi River just playing. This is their backyard. And they come across this little island in the middle of the river. And they go onto the island to explore this island. And they meet Matthew McConaughey's character, whose name is Mud. And they learn really quickly that he is a fugitive. And the reason he's on the run is because he killed a man. And the reason he killed a man was in defense of the woman that he loved. And so the plan for him is he's living on this island trying to build a boat so that he can be reunited with the woman that he loves and ultimately just live on the river on this boat trying to escape the law for the rest of his life. And so he recruits these two young boys, Nick and Ellis, to help him both get supplies for the boat, get food, and then ultimately bring the woman that he loves, her name is Juniper, to the island in secret so he can sail away with her forever. And these two young boys know that this is kind of a risky endeavor. They realize that maybe this isn't the wisest thing to do, but they make their decision to do it based on a question that one of the boys, Ellis, asks Mud. He says, do you love this woman? Like, do you really love her? And he says, yes, I do. Now, there's two other subplots happening in this movie at the same time. Those two subplots are one with Ellis's parents. His parents are on a ro- have a rocky relationship, and they're on the brink of divorce. And Ellis, the other subplot, is that Ellis is falling in love with this girl in his town, and he's trying to pursue her to win her over. And basically, what this movie is about is this young boy's exploration of the question, is love real? Is love real? He wants to help this man because he says he loves this woman. Ellis himself is trying to pursue this young woman, but then he sees his parents' relationship falling apart. And he's dialed into all three of these relationships. But what he experiences throughout the course of the movie is this continual breakdown of what he perceives to be love. Because his parents ultimately divorce and go their separate ways. The girl that he's pursuing ultimately doesn't reciprocate his feelings for her. And then the night before he's supposed to reunite this girl that Mud loves with Mud, he finds out that she has run off with another guy. All three relationships that he's dialed into all break down, and love doesn't seem to win. And there's one scene in the movie that captures the message of this movie in some ways beautifully and a little sorrowly, if that's a word. Uh, Ellis is in a truck with his dad. He's just found out that his parents are going to be divorced. He's also telling his dad about this girl that he loves. And his dad looks to him and he says, Ellis, you can't trust love. Because if you're not careful, one day it will up and walk out on you. And then he sees that play out in every area of his life. See, what this movie captures is that it captures that all of humanity has a universal desire for love, to be loved, to know love, and to experience love. We all want to believe that love is real, and we all want to experience it. But simultaneously, even though we have that desire, simultaneously, we all live with this subtle fear that maybe once we find love, it will someday leave us. And what we all want to know is, is there a love that will never leave? Is there a love that is strong and secure and no matter who I am or what I've been through, it will always stay the course? So if you're here this morning and you're looking for love, if you're here this morning and you have 
recently lost love, or if you're here and you're still wondering, is love even worth it? And is it real? And where do I find it? I think the end of Romans 8 has something for you. This is how our passage begins. Verse 31. What then, Paul says, shall we say in response to these things? Now, if you've tracked closely with what Paul is doing through Romans, you will have probably picked up that his phrase, what shall we say, is a phrase that he regularly uses to advance the letter. You find it at the beginning of chapter 4. You find it at the beginning of chapter 6. You find it in the middle of 6. You find it in the middle of 7. It's all over the place, and he uses it to advance his letter forward. But the real question here, in this question that he's asking, what shall we say in response to these things, is what are these things? What are the these things he's referring to? Now, at some level, it would make sense that he's referring to what he has just said in Romans chapter 8. And what he has said in Romans 8 is that we all are in a place of waiting. We're waiting for the redemption of our world. We're waiting for all things to be restored. And as we are waiting, we're groaning because we live in the brokenness of our world daily. But yet we live with a sense of hope that one day things will be made right He has also talked about how we are adopted. We are adopted sons and daughters of God. We have been entered in. We have been ushered into his family by way of Jesus. And now we have his spirit living within us to empower us, guide us, and direct us. And there has been this declaration of no condemnation. That's how Romans 8 begins. There's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So at one level, these things are in reference to what he has just said in Romans 8. But it's also in reference to what he said from chapter 5 through chapter 8. Because this passage at the end of chapter 8 marks the end of a section that started in chapter 5. And he starts by saying we have peace with God. He says throughout the section that we have been set free from sin and we have been made spiritually alive in Christ. And what Paul has been doing from Romans 5 through Romans 8 is essentially naming our new reality. Naming that all of these things are true of you. For those who have aligned themselves with Jesus, you have been made fully alive. You are set free from sin. You have been adopted as his son or his daughter. There is no condemnation. That is true of you. And then he says, so what shall we say in response to all of these things. Now, what's interesting here is that Paul's next move is to pose a series of questions to his question, right? What shall we say in response to these things? Well, he just starts posing all of these questions, and in doing so, he names five things about God. And the first question that he asks is this. He says in verse 31, the last part of verse 31, if God is for us, here's the question, who can be against us? Essentially, the first thing that Paul is saying about God with this question is that God is for you. He's on your side. He wants good things for you. God is for you. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you believe that he's for you? Because sometimes I think we fall into the, the, the thinking that he's not. Sometimes we think that God is distant and removed and isn't really for us. But he's saying, no, I, I'm with you. I'm for you. I desire good things in your life. And it feels really good to have somebody who is as powerful of, as God on your side. It feels really good to have somebody on your side because there's lots of moments in life where it feels like the world is against us. Uh, a couple months ago, I was rummaging through a, uh, our, our attic and some boxes looking for a thing in particular, and I found this box of stuff from when I was in high school. And I found these old newspaper clippings of sports stories about the team that I played on, pictures of me when I played football and basketball. And then I came across this letter. I was a, I was a high school athlete. Um, I had the privilege of being the starting quarterback of our high school football team 
when I was a senior in high school. I was the worst quarterback that was probably ever around, but it was the time of my life. And we had this rivalry with this team in another state. We only played, you know, conference games in, with teams in New Hampshire, but we lived just on the border of Vermont and New Hampshire, and the team on the other side was Brattleboro. And every year we would play them in kind of like this grunge match sort of thing. They didn't mean anything for the standings, but it was just this great rivalry. So the, the year that I was quarterback, my senior year, we lost. I mean, we got demolished. I threw four interceptions in that game. <laughs> and we had this guy who, the Keen Sentinel was the paper in our town, wrote an article about the game. But there was a player's dad who wrote a response, and I just happened to find this the other day as I was looking through. He starts by saying, um, this letter is in regards to a column published on Sunday, September 19th, in the Sentinel Sports section, written by, and he names the author, about the high school, the Keene Brattleboro High School football game. And this is what he says. It was the worst piece of journalism that I have ever seen since Howard Cossel's uh, was on Monday, Cassell was on Monday Night Football a number of years ago. It's like, okay, tell me how you really feel. <laughs> and, and then he goes on to say all sorts of things, but over half of this letter, he writes about me, and he sticks up for me. He goes, one, the one, speaking of the players that this guy named, the one I feel the worst for is the quarterback, Brian Marvel, who is a senior, by the way, by the way, not a junior, who was given extremely little playing time last year when it was clear that he would be the starting quarterback this year. He is singled out for throwing four interceptions. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Impossible odds. He says, imagine for a moment that, if, if you will, Jerry Rice being intended receiver to 80% of the passes during a game. The only record that Jerry, Joe, and Steve would have had, one would have been the most interceptions and the worst completion percentage ever. I think he's comparing me to Joe Montana and Steve Young, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty great in my book. He said, we would then think that Rice was probably the, would we then think that Rice was probably the best game ever? What he was talking about was play selection and the coaches needed to diversify their play selection. But I remember coming across this. I did read the other guy's article. I read them all. And then I remember coming across this. I was like, somebody's got my back. Like, even when I played horribly, like, and I did, I didn't play well. Even when I played horribly, somebody has my back. And that feels so good. And what Paul is saying in Romans 8 is that God has your back, that he is for you. He's not against you. He wants good in your life, and you're not always going to do it right. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to slip up. You are going to sin. But even in those places, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the first question that he poses. The second question is this, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Here's the question. How will he also along with him not graciously give us all things? Essentially what he is saying is that God has given you everything you need. Not only is God for you, but he has given you everything you need. He says all things. He's given you all things. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says all things are yours in Christ. He has given you everything you need. We live in a context that oftentimes confuses wants with needs, right? And needs with wants. Like just recently, a friend of mine let me borrow their outdoor pizza oven to try making pizza on their outdoor pizza oven. I fired this thing up last night, and immediately, what did I think? I need one of these, right? I need one. Do I really need one? No. But we confuse wants with needs. And when we do that, it's really easy to believe that God has not given us everything we need. And then the logical thing to follow is maybe God is not for me. And maybe he's holding out on me. Like, this is the temptation, believing that is the temptation of all humanity, and it was started back in the garden with Adam and Eve. God creates this good, beautiful world. He puts them in this world. He says, steward this world, partner with me, and you can eat of any tree, any tree in the garden. But then he goes on to say, but there's one you must not eat from. 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then along comes the serpent and starts to sow seeds of doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve. He says, did God really say that you would die? Maybe God's not so good after all. Maybe he's holding something out. He's withholding something from you, and he just doesn't want you to have it because then he knows you will be like him. Which, in reality, that's ironic because Adam and Eve were already like him. They were made in his likeness, in his image. And so they take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat of the fruit, and then sin enters into the world. The two lies that the serpent is sowing into Adam and Eve's life is maybe God's holding out on you, and maybe that means he's actually against you. Maybe he's not really for you. And as sin has entered the world, and our world has been riddled with brokenness, those two lies are pervasive and have been ever since that we easily fall into the trap of thinking God is not for me and he's actually against me. And then here's Paul's third question. He's for you. God's given you everything you need. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Not only is God for you, not only has he given you everything you need, he has also chosen you. He has selected you. He has said, I want that one right there. There's something amazing about being chosen, right? It, it, it helps you see that you've been noticed, you've been seen. There's something about you that has stood out that like, oh, I, that one right there. When I stepped into seminary, I applied for this scholarship. It was going to be like a full ride scholarship. I, I had a pretty decent G, GPA coming out of my undergrad, and I thought for sure that I had a chance at this scholarship. Did all the paperwork, filled it in. Eventually, I got my financial aid package back from school. I opened the letter. It says, Brian Marvel, congratulations. Here is your financial package. And the scholarship I wanted was not on the list. I was not chosen for that scholarship. And I was like, oh, I was so frustrated. Because I thought, like, I had created this narrative in my mind. Do you ever do that? Where you're like, I'm sure I'm going to get it. I'm going to be debt-free from grad school. This is going to be amazing. I'm not debt-free from grad school. I'm still paying off student loans, you know. But I had that narrative created. But then at the end of my seminary years, the last year I was there, I received this letter in my school mailbox that said that I was the recipient of some pastoral award. Like, and there was this old little award ceremony that was... Um, you know, all the awards for the school year were passed out. It was the Arthur Bragley Pastoral Award. And I just was like dumbfounded that I got this award. Because I was like, what? Like, they, there was only one of these that was given out. And I remember being so humbled to think like, what, who saw what in me that they would give me an award that marked the trajectory of my life in being a pastor? And I remember walking up to receive the award thinking like, like, I, I was chosen for this, that, I, that I've been somehow marked out for this. And Paul's saying God has done that with you. He has chosen you. He has noticed you. And, and the point is, like, it should humble us because we're not really deserving of his choosing because the thing that characterizes our life at times isn't always good things. It's always, not always niceties. It's sin. It's brokenness. And Paul has detailed that, detailed that out in great length all through the book of Romans. But yet, even in light of that, he has chosen you. Now, what's interesting that on either side of this reference to God choosing, Paul uses the language of charges being brought against us, right? He says in verse 33, who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? And then he says in verse 34, who then is the one who condemns no one? It's almost as though Paul is saying like, yeah, sure, bring charges against us. Feel free. Bring them our way. Bring them my way because the reality is there are charges against me. The reality is there is sin in my life. 
The reality is there are things that I have done that have transgressed the law of God, that I have offended him. There is no denying that. So go ahead, bring them my way, because that is true. Right? He will say earlier in Romans, this is Romans chapter 3, he says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. One, he's saying, yes, bring charges our way because there are charges against us. However, he says, in the middle of that, right after it says that God has chosen you, he also makes reference to the reality that God has taken care of them because he says at the end of verse 33, it is God who justifies in the same way that it is God who chose you, not so much that we chose God. It is God who does the choosing. He also says, it is He who justifies. It is He who makes things right in our lives. Even though there are charges against us, even though we can be antagonistic, even though we believe the lies that God is not for us, He has not given us everything we need, and that leads us into sin, God has taken care of those charges. And the way that He has done it is through Jesus Christ. That's what He says in verse 34. He says, Jesus Christ who died. The way that we know that God is for us is that he himself, in the form of Jesus Christ, has stepped into our brokenness, stepped into the sin of our world to redeem us and set us free. Paul says in Colossians 2 that the charges that were brought before us were nailed to the cross with Jesus. They have been canceled. Jesus canceled the charges against you because he paid for those charges with his own life, through the shedding of his blood. And not only did Jesus die... But he goes on to say in verse 34, more than that, who was raised to life. Like Jesus defeats death. He defeats the powers of sin. He goes into the grave, comes back to life, and says, no, no, no. Those things don't ultimately win. Sin doesn't win. Death doesn't win. My power and my life wins. He says he is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So in those few verses, not only is God for us, not only has he given us everything we need, not only has he chosen us, but he's justified us, and he's praying for us. He's interceding for us. He's going on behalf of the Father saying, your promise is to do good in their life. Your promise is to do things to bring them into your new future. So I'm here on their behalf is what he's saying. He's interceding for us. I'm here on their behalf saying, do your will in their life. See, basically what Paul is trying to do with these questions and naming these things about God, he's trying to demonstrate that God loves you. That God loves you. Anybody need to hear that this morning? Anybody need to be reminded of that this morning? That he loves you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. See, love is a universal desire. It's something we all want. It's something we all strive for. It's something we all try to attain, and we want it more than anything else. And the purest, most secure version of love is found in God and His love for you. Because even though there's every reason for him not to love us, he does. He continues to pursue us. He continues to go after us. You think of the story of the prodigal son, the younger son who, you know, squanders all of his inheritance. He runs away from home, and when he comes back, he's groveling, hoping the father will maybe just make him like one of his hired men. But the father sees him in the distance. He runs to him. He throws his arms around him. And he throws this huge party to celebrate that my son was lost and he is found. He was dead, but he is alive again. It is God's love and his love alone 
the thing that we want more than anything else. And we go looking for it in all of these other places. And we find it in Jesus. Now, simultaneously, we said, there's also this, this fear that maybe it's a love that will leave us. So growing up a kid in the 90s, um, I used to listen to this band called Everclear. I don't know if there's any Everclear fans from the 90s. Um, they had two pretty big hits. One was Santa Monica, and the other one was a song called Father of Mine. And uh, the lead singer is a guy named Alex in the middle of the picture. His father left him when he was a boy. And he has this song that he wrote about it called Father of Mine, and it details out how much he loved his dad. He held him up on a pedestal, but then the reality was his dad left him. The song starts saying, Father of Mine, tell me where have you been? You know, I just closed my eyes. My whole world disappeared. Father of mine, take me back to the day when I was still your golden boy, back before you went away. He says, I remember the blue skies walking the block. I loved it when you held me high. I loved to hear you talk. You would take me to the movies. You would take me to the beach. You would take me to the place inside that's so hard to reach. It's this picture of this little boy being enthralled with his dad. Just, my dad is a hero. My dad can do anything. My dad's stronger than your dad, sort of thing, right? Like, my dad is my world. And then he says, Father of mine, tell me where did you go? He said, you had the world inside your hand, but you didn't seem to know. Father of mine, tell me what do you see when you look back at your wasted life and you don't see me? The, the irony of this song is it's like an upbeat, fast-paced song, but it's just layered with pain and brokenness, layered with it. And if you listen to interviews where he talks about the song and he details the things that he remembers about growing up without his dad, I mean, it's just one gut punch after the other. And there's this kind of refrain through the song where he says, Daddy gave me a name, and then he walked away. He gave me a name, and then he walked away. But we all live with this fear that the love that we're pursuing might someday walk out on us, might someday leave us behind. And if we're honest with ourselves, in the right moments when we actually can honestly name our fear, it terrifies us. That will there be a love that will leave me? And some of us think this morning, will God's love also leave me? And what Paul is trying to do with this passage is he's trying to detail out, this is who God is. This is what God has done. He is for you. He's given you everything you need. He's chosen you. He's justified you. He's made you right and he's interceding for you. He continually, regularly has your back. And then he ends chapter 8 with one final question in this series of questions. He says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who will do it? Is, there so, like, is that possible? Is there something in our lives that could actually separate us from his love? And then he says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written for your sake, we face death all day long and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He's saying, even though life is difficult, even though it's hard, even though we are groaning our way through it, he says in verse 37, will any of these things separate us from the love of God? He says, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you feel victorious this morning? You should. If you don't, you should. Why? Because God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And his love is strong and secure. It's not going anywhere. Essentially, you could say this is what Paul is trying to communicate. He's trying to capture the reality, answering the question, is there a love that will never leave? God's love. God's love will never, ever leave you. We, we've all had love that's disappointed us somewhere along the way. 
And even in the most secure, strong forms of love that we experience in the here and now will someday leave us because we don't live forever. And there are people in our life who love us and who have left this life. We will find regularly in this world that, yes, love will disappoint us. Love will leave us. God's love is the only one that is constant and secure and remains. And I love the way that Paul ends this in verse 38. He says, for I am convinced. He's convinced. He's betting the farm on the reality that God's love is the only love that's strong, secure, unconditional, steadfast, and will stay the course with you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, no matter who you are, He is with you. He is for you. He's chosen you. He's given you everything you need and more. And He's there interceding before the Father on your behalf. He says, For I'm convinced that neither height nor death excuse me, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Paul starts this section by saying, what shall we say in response to these things? But I wonder if we need to ask the question, Not so much what will we say in response to these things, but what will we do in response to these things? It's one thing to say like, yep, I got that. I acknowledge that. That's great. But what is it that we need to do in response to the reality that God's love will never leave you? I think the thing that we need to do is to nurture that love in our own hearts, because it's so easy to forget it. I I wouldn't be surprised if by the time some of us leave here today and we get home this afternoon, it will be lost on us that God's love is with you and he's for you. And so the challenge for us is how do we continually nurture the love of God in our lives instead of going to all of these other false loves that won't satisfy us? You know, one of the things that that I find regularly in my life is finding a song that I can play almost as like a theme. And it happens for me every few months that I come across a new worship song that just seems to hit the nail on the head for me. That says, ah, I have to listen to this over and over because this is one of the ways I get this truth in my life. Anybody ever get songs stuck in their head? Yeah, all the time. I, I heard a pastor once say the gospel should be one of those songs that gets stuck in our head, that we sing to ourselves repeatedly. And so over the course of the last few months, we've been singing a song called God is for us, that that he is for us, that he is with us, and he will never leave us. And so in response to today, we're going to sing that song as a way to remind ourselves. So we put words on our lips that we sing to ourselves in order to nurture God's love in our hearts, that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that he is with us. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up front. And as we prepare to sing this song, I think the question for us is, we ask ourselves, where do I go looking for the love that I can only find from God? What is that thing in your life where you go to all of these other things looking for love, When all the while, God is saying, I'm right here. I'm giving it to you daily. Will you trust me? Will you receive it? Will you nurture it in your hearts? Because I will never leave you nor forsake you, for I am with you. So may you see that God is for you. May you trust that he has given you everything you need. May you believe that he will never leave you nor forsake you, and that nothing will ever be able to separate you from his love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much.